um, it's uh, so nice to see people sitting down together not wearing masks. <laughs> we never did too much in Sweden though, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're all double vaccinated and have got your boosters and everything is in place, um, uh, given, given your uh, uh, health related responsibilities. No, so it's a delight to be here. And Henry asked me um, some months ago to um, uh, come and talk with you about a lecture uh, about my interest in the lives of um, uh, children seeking asylum and Henry and I have known each other for many years and are good friends outside uh, of our shared interest um, uh, based on um, a wholehearted commitment in, um, to uh, making the lives of uh, unaccompanied children as good as possible in difficult circumstances. So that's um, partly a, a kind of ethical position that we take, but it's also a political position, obviously, which drives us towards considering how best to um, um, receive unaccompanied children when they come to our countries and how to influence uh, practice and how to influence policy and law uh, in a way which is, uh, uh, shines with justice. So it's a hard struggle in any context in order to do that. But that's what we've been committed to for many, many years. And I think you will see as I begin to talk uh, why, um, uh, what some of the complexities are in relation to um, how to disentangle and to understand some of uh, the, uh, the very many uh, difficult strands that young refugees bring to our attention. So that's where I am, and I'm going to start to share my slide with you all. Now, tell me if this doesn't um, um, uh, um, um, appear uh, in any clear form, and I will try and do something about it from this end if it's my technical um, uh, response. Yeah. Okay. So I'm assuming that you can hear me. So the title of the talk, and I gave this talk in Stavanger about a year and a half ago in June 2019. And it was really focusing on a very specific aspect of the lives of unaccompanied asylum seeking children who come to um, uh, all of the Nordic countries, but also to the UK and many other uh, richer nations um, in, in different form. And we were focusing on how to, um, understand these young people in terms of what they say and don't say to us. So essentially in relation to what they talk about, as well as what they remain silent about in their uh, lives and how to have constructive relationships based on what the, the stories that they bring and um, the silences that they bring to us. So, um, my starting point, I think I've declared my hand already in relation to my own um, ethical and polit political uh, positionings. But um, the, the common starting point that I have is that when we talk about uh, the lives of young people, one of the things that we need to get straight is that they are not just a cost and a burden to us and, so and a puzzle that needs solving. Um, that they come with a sense of being alive and a sense of liveliness and a, and a wish to contribute to our lives, not so much to uh, receive things from us as wealthier, more powerful people. So the reception story is just one element of what um, we face. We also need to face the idea that they bring vitality. And what I want to focus on in, in, in that broad context is the sense of movement that they bring, the sense of life that they bring, and the sense of the multiple worlds that they bring with them, uh, not just as receivers of services, but as um, people with talents and interests and a will to be more Swedish, to be more UK based, to be more British, to be part of um, our lives. And before they can get to that vitality, I think they have to cross many hurdles and silences and stories and the ways in which they construct their lives are part of the impediments that you and they face, you as clinicians and them as, as people who 
need you as part of the scaffolding in order to regrow their lives. So I'm going to really just kind of talk in, in, in quite um, 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 intricate ways on some of the movements that you and they need to make in order to understand how they can safely move from contexts of violence, which is what they're coming from, generally speaking, to contexts of vitality and coming back to life. One of the uh, important aspects, I guess, is um, that um, um, in common with many young people under duress, they have experienced the death of ordinary life. And our job and our gift and our opportunity is to face them and to see how we can help them to regrow ordinary life, to breathe life back into life. And that is a very exciting opportunity for those of us who are powerful enough and rich enough and intelligent enough and committed enough to make their lives work. It's a great opportunity for us to feel more human with them. So this big endeavor, which is to how to resurrect ordinariness is a, a lovely chance for us to feel alive too. And I'm gonna start with a story to tell you which emerges from some of the uh, project work that I'm currently doing using art therapy as a way of helping young people to tell their stories, both of their survival and their vitality. So I work with a, an organization called Art Refuge, which is a, a collection of art therapists who go into some of the refugee camps um, that are around in Europe where young refugees gather in order to help them do art activities, just to feel for an hour, for two hours, for a day, just to feel kind of normal, dissociated from the pressing um, pressures which do their heads in. So art is a way of just feeling ordinary. And um, during um, uh, one of their sessions, they brought to my attention something about uh, a piece of art that a young person had created and he created what you can see in front of you, which is um, a clay mobile phone. And I asked the art therapist about how that piece of art arose. And they said, well, you know, one of the things that they face on a regular basis is quite a lot of violence by the uh, uh, police that the police come and destroy the camps, particularly in um, the Calais region. And, and uh, violence is just a normal part of everyday life, that this happens on a regular basis. And one of the things that they do is that they rob the kids of ordinariness. And I said, how is that? And they said, well, you know, the kids are totally connected to their phones. The phones themselves are ways in which they feel alive, uh, engaged with their networks, their memories, their phones have maps, they have games, they have music, they have information and about the routes forward in life and the routes back into the country of origin. So if you take a child's phone away, if you snatch it from the child, if you smash it with your, the heel of your boot, the architecture of ordinary life begins to crumble. And it's in terms of um, the way of controlling young people who are seeking refuge, it's a very powerful thing to do to deconstruct the phone. And one day a young man who'd had his phone broken came to Art Refuge, one of their sessions, and started to make this out of clay. And when they got talking to him, they said, um, you know, what made you choose this object? What made you create this? And he said, you know, even if they've taken my real phone away, I can just for a moment, I can make something and I can pretend that I have something in my hand, which I need to make my life back. And he'd spent an hour in a focused way making this phone. And you will see that it's a very old fashioned analog phone. It isn't one of our new um, phones, but that's all he could afford. And that's what he's recreated. And here in the middle of the small screen um, is um, 
rather than uh, the um, uh, phone provider O2, which is a very well known phone provider here in the UK, the kid has put OK. It's a reclamation of his life and his willingness to survive and to go on. And I tell you that story at the beginning because all of their lives, to some degree, are constructed out of stories of one sort or another, of being able to um, um, reclaim things in points of fracture. And the bits that they are reclaiming in, in, in terms of my own research uh, belong within three dimensions ordinarily. The ordinary life that needs to regrow consists of creating a sense of safety, a sense of belonging over time, and a success and a sense of being successful in terms of the life projects that they have uh, reached out towards when claiming asylum. And broadly, I want to just very quickly just demonstrate a couple of things in relation to my own research. By safety, I mean, of course, legal safety, that is getting some sort of status to uh, have permanent sanctuary in the country. And we know in Sweden, we know as well in the UK and other um, countries, how difficult it is to achieve legal safety for uh, refugee children. But I also, in this sense, mean practical and material safety, the kind of the common every day, having a front door to call, call your own, having a key to a door, having furniture, having a TV, having food, having a table. So those practical aspects of safety emerge, as well as the safety within their internal worlds, their psychological architecture, which helps them to feel as if they can wake up in a day and move along. So when those sort of aspects of safety begin to take shape, the young people begin to reach out and create and be part of and be embedded within social networks, which are along the horizontal aspects of their lives, as well as using formal networks, um, education, health, social care, immigration, police and so on, using those powerful networks to arrange the vertical aspects of their lives so that the horizontal and the vertical can live together in order to generate a sense of being successful over time and being able to be an active citizen who can take part in education, can have a house and a home and create a sense of themselves, which is around the coalescence of respect and authority over time. And of course, you know, when I tell you this story, I lay it out in this very neat form that safety happens, that belonging happens, that success happens. And what we know, and from your clinical work, what you're probably likely to see is that there is no such thing as a straight line in children's lives in this way, that the blue light, lights here indicate that as life is lived, it's in a much messier form, that safety comes and goes, that belonging comes and goes, that success comes and goes, and that life cannot be lived through um, simply creating neat stories which put one position, then another, and then another. So just remember uh, this level of complexity as I walk you through the other slides that remain. And the final point I just want to make is that um, these aspects that I've got at the bottom, that they, young people are climatized, they adapt, they begin to participate, they begin to absorb, are all aspects of the known trajectories of young asylum seekers who become refugees in our countries. That all of this takes time and it can take extended periods of time. And the final element, which um, I keep coming back to, which I often ask young people when they, um, uh, when they felt at home in a new country. And it isn't during a time of receiving help. It's at a time when they can begin to reciprocate and put something back into the country that's accepted them that they feel good, they feel as if they belong, they feel as if they're successful at a time not of uh, adapting, 
but at a time of reciprocation. So the neatness is an issue. The neatness of telling stories, the neatness of classifying young people either legally or um, medically in some way, of uh, categorizing them, is only one part of the story. And we know the thing about life and its messiness, because we are part of the mess in our own lives, is that um, no matter how hard we try to put it into boxes, that life has its own capacity to find its own way out of the boxes that we put it in. That it's organic, it's multiple, it's unmechanical, all of the words that I'm using here. And um, that when we turn that organic nature of living into stories, then what we are in some senses doing is turning the technicolor of life into the black and white versions, which help us explain how a colorful life is lived. So stories are one part of life, but I don't think can ever wholly capture what it is to be a young asylum seeker. And for them, quite often when they tell a story and when they continue to repeat stories about themselves, and Henry knows this from his own work with undocumented children, is that there is a danger sometimes that you become the story. That through repetition, and through a way of having to explain to powerful authorities who you are and what became of you and what you want to be, that you rub out the contradictions, the uh, difficulties, the details uh, of life, and that you become something which is simpler than who you are. And I think part of our responsibility as clinicians is to get to the intricacies, the organic, movement of life, not just the labeling of the story. And I've, um, I've just put this up just suddenly this morning because I thought you might be interested if you want to take it down as a, a reference. Uh, that I've been interested um, for quite some time about how people choose to remember and how they choose to forget in order to have a life worth living. And uh, this article is considering uh, the relationship between remembering and forgetting, um, which allows um, a peaceful life to emerge over time. And what the relationship is between memories that you hold, mementos that you bring with you into a new country, and things that you remember as part of a group, the memorialization aspects of your lives, and it's particularly focused in this instance on young Afghans, but I think applies to many different nationalities of people who come to uh, our countries. So if you, uh, it's an open access um, article, so it shouldn't cost you anything to uh, download it. And if you do read it, I'd really welcome uh, you contacting me to tell me what you think. It's written with a, a wonderful colleague from, uh, of mine from Norway. So let's get back to the issue of uh, uh, stories as they are told. Now we know, those of us who've worked with um, refugees, that um, when you talk, one of the things that you become aware of very quickly is that it's not just the story that's told, it's also the story that's hidden, which needs to be understood in order for um, um, the whole, person to be put in front of you. But of course, refugees, like all the rest of us, we're going to curate our lives. There's no instance when we ourselves don't edit our own lives. And there's no reason, therefore, to think that refugees are going to be any different to us in relation to how they present the exhibition, which is their life. They will show you some pictures, they will put some pictures away. Some of them will remain within the sunlight and others will remain in the shadows and that's normal. But the imperative from a refugee point of view is that this curation is done in a selective way in order to remain alive. It's not done in the way that we do it, which is to kind of uh, have a sense of our own privacy and um, a sense of uh, being able to put our best foot forward uh, when we are uh, being interviewed for a job, for example. It's not to do with uh, finding new and successful ways of life sometimes, it's to do with being alive or not. 
So in order to get refugee status, people have to be creative and they have to decide what to show and what to hide. And what we know as you get to know young refugees over time is that stories evolve over time, that they move and they are punctuated quite often, not just by words spoken or words written, but by large fields of silence that appear sometimes, which are unspeakable, but which are present and which are part of the overall way of living. And Bakhtin's words in relation to uh, linguistics have a very direct and uh, enticing meaning for us as clinicians. When we're faced with refugees, what we remember Bakhtin saying is that each word tastes of the context and context in which it has lived its socially charged life. So the words that are put into stories, the ways in which they are arranged, helps you to see some aspects and to understand not just the the surface of the story, not just the skin of the story, but the body that lies beneath. So a child will come to you presenting as a child, but you might understand them. If you are an immigration officer, you might need to understand them as a migrant first rather than a child. A child will look for a guardian, but might experience you as a guard. A child will want you to perhaps gently explore some of the complexity but you might be in a position of having to get a story which has a sequence. This happened, this happened, this happened, and then that happened. So a story in a straight line rather than in a messy uh, interconnectedness. And that um, what might emerge is not just stories of uh, the complexity, but explanations of how they came to Sweden or how they came to the UK. Uh, and some elements that you are the authority and the power holder and that you need to be appeased in order for it, for their lives to work. And in the end, not as a clinician, but perhaps as somebody seen, uh, attributed with a lot of power, what they need from you is a sense of being affirmed for who they are and what they might sometimes end up if you haven't taken into account some of their fears and vulnerability and silences, they might end up wanting to appease you and explain to you and sequence to you and be on their guard as a migrant needing your uh, support. So in those sort of complicated contexts, they have to choose where to place the story and where the story takes place. Now, I want to just um, quickly go through this um, triangle so that um, I, I, I can make sure that I've covered some of the territory which is familiar to young refugees. Now, not all stories are created equal and not all encounters are created equal. So I'm going to start at, at the bottom of the triangle uh, around here at the asylum interviews, which is where I was taking you in my previous slide. The asylum interviews and the conversations that happen are really about privileging life and death stories and experiencing adversarial questions from um, uh, border guards who hold your life under a microscope. And in similar ways, when you get to public service interviews with social care, with social workers and so on, uh, or with welfare um, 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 benefits people, you have to tell watchful stories that these are not life and death stories in the urgent sense, but they are constructed with people who are resource holders, whose resources you need, and you are, have to be pretty careful about not putting a foot wrong. And then you move a step down from that or a step across from that a, a, in a broader frame and you talk, think about how young people are reacting to therapeutic encounters when they meet clinicians or when they meet um, people who they think might listen sympathetically to their uh, stories. And people who are interested not so much in uh, the adversarial elements of the sequence of what happened, but are asking questions which are about wonder 
which are about interest. And instead of being, using a microscope, they're using a wide angle lens in order to frame the stories that young people tell. And in these therapeutic encounters, there is a sense that the careful stories can begin to feel as if they can come alive again into more entangled, more messy, more wandering ways of responding rather than having to uh, be very marshaled. And in the broad, broadest frame of those, um, uh, broadest frame still, those of social encounters, we end up um, witnessing young people telling, op having open-ended conversations. That is not worrying about the messiness of a story in order to feel as if they belong within a, uh, the space that they're in. <coughs> so that the social encounter stories are the whole intricate mess of life, whereas the asylum interviews are that very sharp, pointy, absolutely life and death element of life. So young people are at the same time in their lives, ranging across a whole set of contexts, and in Bakhtin's terms, using words which have, uh, which generate the most meaning within each of those contexts. So this multiplicity of living is something that they have to um, manage the whole time. And to be absolutely honest with you, I've seen young people so exhausted by managing the multiplicity. It's been, you know, it's been a, it, I often think I love being in this territory because it's so complex. It's, it really challenges me emotionally and intellectually. And so, and so you see these young people carrying these multiple worlds, carrying the sensitivity towards um, um, silence and stories. And um, you wonder how they ever have shoulders big enough to be able to carry it all across the whole of time. And it is remarkable. And, you know, it, sometimes it just honestly, to me, it feels like an honor to be with them. So I'll just say that now. <coughs> So in terms of managing stories, one of the things that we encounter is not just the light that the story brings, but the shadows that the silences bring. Um, and um, in, in, in encounters with public authorities, particularly, there can be a worry that children are being secretive, that they're not um, being private, as the, like we would consider ourselves not telling stories about an act of privacy. For young people, it can become an act of secrecy. And this judgment is um, part of the encounter, especially in asylum determination decisions, that um, the silence is interpreted in a narrow way about secrecy than in a broader way around privacy. So one of the things that I've written about is that children have to construct thin stories that hide thicker lives, that they can't talk about the mess, they have to be neat in order to get by. And <clears throat> they have to constantly be judging who to trust and how a gatekeeper will behave um, in relation to how they are in front of them. And one of the encounters for me as a researcher is to try to find thick explanations for thin stories. What are the thin stories about? And what do the silences mean? And what do they do as part of that encounter? So looking for thick explanations becomes part of my job, um, as well as uh, something that I encounter in uh, the, the conversations that I have with lawmakers and politicians and policy makers and practitioners. That the broad appeal is, let's just try and understand in a sympathetic way how to help children to manage their lives in difficult circumstances and how in some circumstances to try and restory uh, narratives which can become very stiff which can become only about talking about the wounded nature of life, how to restory that into something which allows the wounds not to be the dominant feature of life. And I know through my own encounters, and of course, um, uh, Henry will tell you this in terms of his own work, 
um, that um, we constantly are aware of stories that are gathered, that they're stored, some are ignored and told and retold, they're edited and segmented and so on, that no story stays the same over time. And some stories are about improvising, that is making a story up on the spot. And some stories are about orchestration, that is your part of a, a, a choir, that you are telling stories which are going to um, tell, which are going to sound similar to other people's stories over time. And that the way that you tell the story faces you with the opportunity and the threat of integrating and disintegrating at the same time in your new country. That what you bring with you is not anything <coughs> which is wholly good or wholly bad. That you are constantly aware that you need to fit in, that you need to be a good citizen, that you need to be seen to be grateful, that you are tidy, that you are obedient. I mean, in some senses, to be honest, this is true for all migrants. I say this as a migrant in the UK that uh, <coughs> part of my encounter in terms of practicing how to be English was to watch English people very carefully and learn what their rules of behavior were in order to um, become a bit of a chameleon over time. So I've ended up, nowadays I sound very British. Listen to my accent. You'd never think that when I came to this country, I didn't, didn't speak English. And now I speak it like a middle-class, good middle-class person. And that, that is um, a way of uh, practicing over time and practicing happiness and actually metabolizing sadness over time. And um, let me just uh, move on from some of these things uh, without dwelling on some of the slides too, um, too, too um, much because I think we've covered some of these points. When I send you uh, the presentation, you can have a look at this. Um, <clears throat> but there's two points I'll quickly make in relation to this slide. When you encounter young refugees, one of the things that you notice is that time happens sometimes in a different way. What I've said in my own writing is that they want to focus on the present first, the future next, and the past last. That the past isn't the first thing that they bring to you, that the arrangement of time is um, based on being able to do something tolerable and necessary at the right time. So quite often, the practicalities of living will be the first things that you encounter. The plans of living will be the second thing. And then if they trust you over time, they'll bring the past to you. But don't please ever try to rush towards the past unless the young person invites you to do that. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on from this one. You can look at it in your own time. And the things that I've alluded to in relation to the silence issue are that uh, silence should not be treated with suspicion. It can be because sometimes, um, as I said, secrets uh, are become the preoccupation rather than privacy. And sometimes you can think well, a child is silent because they've been basically they've been through war and war silences children, that there is an aspect of trauma related uh, management of uh, storytelling, which leads to silence. But uh, there are many psychotherapists and very helpfully also saying that don't uh, worry about the silence so much because you can see quite often when people are silent that uh, it is a form of psychological hypothermia that they go into a quiet space in order to talk within themselves, in order to compose themselves, in order to recover the outside world. That the silence is a functional part of recomposing yourself. But in any case, given that the, there are very many competing um, uh, explanations for why silence arises, you can see why I, I might say that silence is both burdensome and protective and um, it can carry into the relationship with you as the helper. It can carry a functional level of distrust from the young asylum seeker uh, where they watch you first before they talk to you second. 
And oh, pardon me. This is the joy of working from home. Um, so part of what you will encounter with them, as I've said, in relation to uh, other aspects, is uh, the notion of telling thin stories on the basis of thicker lives. And they can only tell about their thicker lives once they um, are able to uh, trust you. And once they know that the thin stories are not going to be um, misused by you in relation to the services that you have to offer. I'm going to stop talking for five minutes and I'm going to give you an example of a story by a young person. Now listen to this story because you might find that it's very familiar for you if you've worked with unaccompanied children before. <coughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is my story about myself. I was born in Afghanistan in 1994, in the city of Jalalabad. In the city of Jalalabad, um, when I'm in the Afghanistan, I'm very happy. My life, everything is very happy. And uh, my father is a car businessman. We are very really rich. We are, our life is very good. In the 2007, in the, in the beginning, is is our life is bad. Some people come into my house and they challenge my father. They want some money with my father, but my father is not giving no money because this is Taliban. After some, a few days, after they kidnap my father and they kill my father and they want also kill me. And uh, my mother say, you will go I do not want to kill you, this people, and my mother sent me here. And uh, my travel is starting in 2007. My first travel to the Afghanistan with Pakistan, when I'm coming to Pakistan, I stay in Pakistan a lot of time, and after one family, I'm coming to buy flight to Turkey. And the Turkey after, I'm in the, a lot of time in Turkey, I'm coming to after by Greece, Larry uh, in Greece and after a lot of time in the Greece, uh, after in the Larry, I'm coming to Italy. And after the Italy, I'm coming to France and the France is a lot of time. And after I'm coming to UK, I see in the, where is a lot of country. And in um, the country is different people and different house. Now I'm in this country, I'm very happy. My, safe, uh, my life is very safe and I want to help for this country and uh, I want to become a doctor here and um, I want to work here. Thank you. So here is a simple story told beautifully by Cameron, and I'm telling you, showing it to you for, for two reasons. One is that uh, you may already be familiar with this story, that you may already know this story from other uh, people from different countries. That is something, the, and the simple plot is, I was alive as a child, something catastrophic happened, I had to leave, I've come here, thank you very much for having me, I want to put something back into your country. This simple plot line um, is a lifeline for young people. It's not um, easy to um, um, construct it. It's not easy to live it, in fact, because uh, life, as I said, is uh, uh, much more uh, complex than that. But it's a story of aspiration in some degree. And it's a story which can be treated with suspicion when you hear lots and lots of young people telling something which follows that plot line that you can begin to disbelieve them rather than to look at the the individual who's had to tell that story to you in order to get by and in order to feel as if you are going to allow them to stay alive imagine being that young person and the second reason i'm telling you the story is because 
of course, Kamran has constructed something which is um, a beautiful piece of film. Here is a man with talent already at his fingertips, being able to not just tell a plot line story, but to create an animation with the help of other people. This is funded by the government in uh, uh, when it was uh, a department for children, school and families, now the Department of Education. But it's created using his talent. And his talent is not to be missed. I'm going to, I'm afraid because of time, skip through this slide. And you, you can, <coughs> I'll talk about it with you at another time if we have time, but um, this is again presenting something of my own research um, earlier uh, about the ways in which those of us who help young people become humanitarians, become witnesses and become their confederates or companions over time in order to help them. But let's um, um, uh, just cut to the chase and cut to some of the summaries that need to happen in order to understand how best to help these young people. I think in <coughs> the 20 years that I've worked in this uh, territory, these messages keep recurring, so I'm going to repeat them. One of the things that needs to be established first is a sense that you are a trustworthy helper, that you are honest, clear, reliable, kind, warm, attached, and a precise person, that you can bring order and safety into their lives, that you can fix things if they need fixing, that you can bring a sense with them of co-generating peace and belonging, that if you witness their stories, that you are not just saturated by their sadness, but that you can actually help them as a memory holder. And finally, that you can belong within that pattern and rhythm of life which generates success, that you become over time somebody who feels at least <coughs> like a protective friend and the greatest honor of all, I have to say, which is a missing family member, somebody who may have died, but is resurrected in the form that is you, somebody who can be subversive in an ethical way, who can be an optimist and allow them to show and allow for you to see their complex world. And just before I finish and allow a few minutes for questions, I want to just come back to Sweden because basically this is a lovely short film which you're going to enjoy, I think. And it's done by one of my um, ex PhD students, a wonderful, talented uh, filmmaker, as well as a public servant. Uh, and I'm, I just feel proud of this film. So I'm going to show it to you. Watch. Jag kan känna bra bygar och jag lär sig hur man jobbar. Jag vill hjälpa min familj. Utan jag ska spara till Sjöko. Jag kommer till Sverige. Jag bor nu cirka ett år. Jag klarade det allt själv. Jag har ingen från min familj med mig. I livet är det jobbiga att bli ensam. Jag undrar när jag ska träffa dem. Det är all my life. Allt det är i min hjärna. Ibland jag känner jag som barn. Ibland jag känner jag som vuxen. Det är skönt att du blir barn. Du kan tänka. Du vill inte stressa. Jag vill att jag blir läkare. Det är min stora drömmar. Jag vill jobba på The Red Cross or UN. De vet ingenting. Barn, de kommer till vår. Så jag vet vad de är för. Allt är då det mycket, mycket barn. Rafael, this is are so kind and friendly family. They can understand what I feel without talking. 
they just can say, for sure they, for sure they have what to think. And this guy, but they be Allah said, they are far at the funka. The mother said it made her to think uh, to come at her, we are but in family. You must also think a potato implant at you. The soft for the high school kind of rumor. Yet fresh from stress. Huh? And the finishing to make many for her. Many will learn to can her or to brought them for her. No. In story the man you see me family help me me. The main picture got wrong. You have passed. So let me just summarize some of those things. It's very difficult talking about the notion of success without talking about its complexity. But one of the things that we know in the lives of young refugees that success isn't accidental. It doesn't happen to you, you happen to it. And that um, in order to uh, move from a position of staying alive to living and feeling as if life is coming back, <coughs> takes time. And one of the things that you know, and they know, and we know is that life is stubborn. It doesn't give up on itself easily, that it keeps insisting on growing back in most circumstances where you can provide some roots. It can, of course, be lonely and requires reliable companions of all sorts, both within the horizontal frames of living, as well as the vertical frames of service provision. And in both those frames, young people can experience generosity and fear simultaneously because they carry these multiple worlds with them. And like success, over time, peace is made. It's not found. And I'm on that basis going to stop and to ask you to, uh, uh, to um, respond to some of the things that I've said. Is that enough? I've talked enough, haven't I? So I want to thank you so much, uh, Ravi, for this wonderful presentation. Very interesting and also very moving. Uh, so we open up for questions and discussions. So if anyone has something they want to ask or say to comment on what on your presentation, if there's anyone in the room. or anyone in the digital forum. If not, I, I, have, I start with a, a reflection um, because what I feel when, when, when I'm thinking myself into my, uh, the daily work where I sometimes meet some of, of the, those children that you, you speak about with this background, Often I, I'm a pediatrician and some, sometimes I meet them in the, uh, in the polyclinic, maybe coming to them on emergency ward or uh, often seeking for a somatic reason, uh, maybe with stomach pain, with headache. And uh, the usual case is that I, I, 
as for the, the history, the history taking, and uh, nothing really abnormal comes up more than the, than the pain. Uh, and now I'm generalizing, but and many times I, it's, I don't find maybe any real pathological finding, but I have the feeling that there is something underlying. And one of my, my, my differential diagnoses is that, that this is a psychosomatic uh, pain, but I don't get really through. And, I feel that it's hard to to get the story to to get them to open up, and I realize that it's difficult in this time in this meeting to to gain their trust. Uh, so I think I just want to have your uh, maybe advice or opinions on how how can I uh, interact with them in a way maybe to that that can be beneficial for them uh, in that encounter. Of course, I need to get the good information to make a good medical um, assessment, but also to maybe help them in another way. Yes, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a very familiar dilemma uh, <clears throat> that you describe. Um, um, and I'm just wondering whether the people in the room, whether they have similar uh, experiences or whether in terms of the clinical expertise that's in this meeting, mm -hmm how they address what you, the problem that you are identifying. So it'd be interesting to hear from other people. Mm -hmm. Can you feel some of the same dilemma or, or you have other experiences? I think it's the same because usually I meet them at the emergency department and then you don't, you know, if you are going to build up trust and make a person open up, you have to meet them several times and have time mm -hmm. and we don't have it. But, um, and I think Barn Lecker, Motorling, and like we have um, uh, clinics that mm. uh, uh, where you meet the same doctors. I feel also they don't have time anymore because now it's a lot of private. Mm. So yes. I think it's uh, hard because there is the doctors don't have time <laughs> to see, you yeah. know, and build up trust. So, yeah, exactly. And to, to maybe to make another appointment in a week's time to yeah. to follow up and to 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 start that relationship. Uh, I think it's also not seen upon as our job. Maybe yeah. our job is more to identify that here is a somatic problem or a psychological problem, and then refer mm -hmm. to someone else. But then, how can we identify that if we don't gain the trust in the first place? That's a Dilemma, I think. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you miss like having the opportunity to to have a sub acute clinic that you can put on your patients that you meet at the emergency room uh, to meet them later in two weeks, one week. But we mm -hmm. don't have that. We're rotating a lot, and you, you can't really choose. Like you don't have any spare time to to meet patients that you may really want to speak to again or build the trust and mm. we don't have that system and I sometimes miss that uh, especially when you're like in the pizza emergency and you have five ten minutes per patient and you have to rush um, so uh, it would be mm. nice to have mm. and uh, Ravi don't you see, because some it, I feel also that if you're going to build trust uh, with a person that has a lot of history, it, it's not enough with two times. I don't know your opinion. It feels more like you have to meet that person maybe five to ten times or so for the person to open up. But what's your opinion about that, do you think? Yeah, I think that um, my experience is that um, trust will always take time to build. Uh, that uh, uh, trust is not a um a magical event it's not a magical uh, occurrence um that it's uh, only based on hard work <clears throat> and continuity and actually what you're describing is um uh something that could also be applied i presume to other patients not just re young refugees that uh if you're constantly on the move between clinics <coughs> and you're constantly short of time then that, in terms of your own general clinical practices, is a problem for the context. It's not, it, and therefore it becomes a problem between you and the patient. And therefore the solution to, um, or the resolution of the problem 
which is about how to move beyond the skin of a story down deeper into the depths of a person, which is what you're wanting to do. How do you find the time to do that <clears throat> over a period of time in terms of a regular um, uh, set of meetings which allow you and the patient to establish a working relationship? It, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I think the, the it, unfortunately, but as I listen, this is a problem which is far too familiar. And actually, the, 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 the causes of the problem are systemic rather than relational. Mm. Mm. And I, I also think that uh, there is a, maybe a fear, what you will hear, uh, that you're afraid of, of what, what this person will give you what kind of what 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 the story is because what uh, what will you do with it, with this information as you said Morten if you're in a clinic you're working uh, as a medical doctor and you're supposed to take care of the medical problems so if they give you if someone gives you a story that is heartbreaking or or uh, tough but it's not really a medical problem what would you do with that story they they trust they someone trusted you and gave you the story and and now you're there with with the story in your knee so to speak mm -hmm. i think that's a problem too mm -hmm. yes and beautifully uh, beautifully articulated uh, problem which is um the difficulty of being a witness and being able to um um absorb the complexity or the pain or the depth of pain that somebody has brought to your attention and but if, uh, yeah. sorry but if uh, also as you say Olivia, that you get this story and you even perhaps get some so sort of trust but you are not the one who will meet the person the next day mm -hmm. or so so you have perhaps uh, spent quite a lot of I, i'm thinking actually uh, of the uh, child psychiatry patients where it's and also where, because they have also distrust uh, usually because they have met so many people and they have been asking so but and then you get the trust and then there is a problem and now i have to leave you over to the child endocrinologist or whatever other person who will take care of the problem and you and i won't you gave me you gave me your very important story we had some connection and then we we won't meet again. Yeah, and, but, and then you will you will just raise the distrust. Why should I trust someone when they are just leaving me tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we've discussed a bit, and it's a bit Henry's not here um, because we've discussed in the group a bit also the importance and potential benefits of having specialized refugee clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, that are capable of taking a more holistic approach mm -hmm. to these patients. But do, do you have that a lot in the UK? And what's your experience from that? Yes, we have, um, we have specialized clinics. Um, um, uh, and, uh, but they're mostly in, um, um, in cities rather than in more rural areas of the country. <coughs> um, and um, um, the clinics can work to uh, um, um, with uh, young refugees um, very well, but the capacity of the clinics is um, very small in comparison to the amount of needs that's presented within a large cohort of young people wanting a particular therapeutic service. So um, there, um, I'm thinking of. Um, um, the Medical Foundation for the Care of Victims of Torture, <coughs> which is um, uh, uh, one specialist agency uh, working in Glasgow, which is the city I'm working in at the moment. They often take specialist referrals of young refugees. The, the, um, um, the advantage of that is that you get um, people who are familiar with um, um, some of the complexity of uh, refugee lives and able to work in depth with some of the traumas that uh, are brought to them uh, and over extended periods of time. <coughs> uh, 
the dis disadvantages that it's because it's not part of a, um, a fully funded normal service, the demands on it are much uh, greater than its capacity to offer a service. So there is there is something about specialism which works, but in a very limited way. Is there are there specialist services in uh, in your context? In Stockholm, we have a trauma center, but I, I know people that works there, and it's uh, and it's private, so they are forced to do uh, fast and uh, take uh, as much as patient they can. So, from my inside info, is uh, uh, not um, uh, working well because of the they don't they want to, if you're a psychologist that works there and you want to work um, evidence based therapy for trauma, but that time doesn't exist. So, so yeah. they're clinic, but they are private, so they don't have the, yeah, they, they are problems. Uh, Henry, I see you're back uh, from your meeting. Um, uh, welcome back. Uh, we were just dwelling on the balance between specialist services and generic, ser generic medical services uh, in terms of uh, uh, responding to need amongst refugee populations. Uh, what what is the, what are the key things from your point of view which need to be balanced? Ooh, it's a difficult question, I think. Uh, but I, I think there is a big need for for uh, education and and uh, uh, well continuous education for in in uh, non specialist healthcare. Uh, because there are many many special aspects that uh, is is that that are special for this this group of young people i think uh, so so i think in sweden there is a lack of of uh, uh, proper evidence based and adapted health services uh, targeted to uh, unaccompanied minors and I think also, I think we can see a period now that of of, of reducing this type of health services since uh, politicians uh, think that uh, the the number of in, new uh, unaccompanied uh, minors are decreasing. They think the problem is solved. And what what uh, I'm I'm you know, I'm working at the child refugee center, which is a combined. Um, center with combined uh, child psychiatric and pediatric competence, which is uh, unique in Sweden, um, and and um, uh, what we see is that many of the problems, uh, or or for people who have been for a, a period of time in Sweden, many problems are coming up right now. Uh, after after a long period of time, uh, not at least uh, children in families that have stayed longer and, and where the, the traumas of the parents uh, affect the whole family and the children very much. Uh, so, so I think um, it's it's very sad if the services will be cut down and and the uh, experience and knowledge will be uh, lost. Um, I think that's very counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I think the the, the other. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. It's it's um, perhaps we need to. Um, uh, our time is up, and we need to um, um, finish the meeting. But uh, one of the things that is important for me to say is that it's not just a story about um, the presence or the absence of specialist medical services. Um, it's also a story about how other services are adapted and work uh, in unison with um, medical services in order to provide um, um, a therapeutic impact into the lives of young refugees. So for me, an example of that is um, a very good guardianship service in uh, Scotland, which is not like the Swedish model of guardianship particularly, uh, but it's a publicly funded service where uh, guardians have extended long term relationships <coughs> with young people uh, from the point of arrival into a country to uh, uh, until their mid 20s or um, later for six or seven years on average. And they are working with all professions, including medical professions, to make sure that the young person's life works out. So having even if you are worried about 
you being able to only provide the single event, having somebody in their lives who provides the continuity and who that service is or who that person is, is also fundamentally important. So continuity and singularity can live side by side. Thank you very much for that. That was those last words, Ravi. Uh, I think this was a very fruitful uh, discussion, but uh, that, that has to be continued. Uh, and I think we have a theme for another webinar uh, in our society in the future. Uh, so, as you said, our time for this uh, presentation is up, uh, and uh, we have now some uh, time for coffee break until we come back at uh, 14.50, I think, for the next presenta presentation. But uh, thank you again, Ravi. I think we give you an applause. That's fine. Right. <laughs> uh, if you're not here to receive some flowers, we will make a small donation uh, for some organization working with these issues. Your name. You know, my re my reward is to see Henry's face again, so I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs>